Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name's Ken Hinchcliffe. I'm the warden and CEO of Trinity College, uh, which with our friends at the Melbourne Law School is hosting uh, this lecture this evening, this oration this evening. Um, I'll be introducing our speaker very soon, but before I do, I'd like to um, ask Maggie Blandon, who's a Trinity alumni, alumnus, um, and a current JD student in the Melbourne Law School to deliver an acknowledgement of country on behalf of all of us. Maggie, please. Thank you very much, Ken, for that lovely introduction. I do have to critique that, though. I am an, an alumni now of Melbourne Law School, and I'm very proud of that. So I want everyone here to know that I've finished now. <laughs> Um, but in my language, the Palawakani, um, Ya Palingana all, my name is Maggie Blandon. I'm a proud Palawa woman from Lutruwira, Tasmania, and I'm so honoured to be here tonight to give the acknowledgement of country. I was born and raised on country and in my matriarchal, strong, black and very proud community in Nipaluna, Hobart. And I can't do an acknowledgement without paying respect and honouring my family, um, my matriarch, um, Granny Ducks, Auntie Ida West, and my pop, Daryl West. Without them, I wouldn't know the importance and the benefit of black excellence and the power of education. As Ken said, I'm an alumni or alumnus of Trinity College, uh, the University of Melbourne, and Melbourne Law School. I would like to start tonight's speech with an acknowledgement of country um, for the land that we're meeting on and so grateful to be learning here tonight. Here at Melbourne Law School, we are gathered on both Wurundjeri, Wurrung and Bunurong country, and I would like to pay respect to their elders past and present for nurturing the lands, waters and skies that we are so blessed to inhibit. We are visitors on this country. We all need to remember that, and we should not take it for granted. As legal minds, we must continue to decolonize the systems that we work in, and many of us benefit from. We must also create space meaningfully and genuinely for Indigenous representation in the legal system. Nairin in a two and Woolika, thank you and goodbye. Maggie, my apologies. Time goes so quickly and it seems like just yesterday you were in the dining hall at Trinity. So first, a couple of housekeeping matters. In the case of emergency, follow instructions and the exit signs to leave the room in the building. And for those of you with, or for those of us, uh, with mobile phones and devices that ping, ding or ring, would you mind adjusting them so that they don't interrupt uh, the speaker, any of the speakers this evening? I'd really appreciate that. After the oration, there will be a question and answer session curated by Dr. Olivia Barr, who's an associate professor at the Melbourne Law School. Olivia is a non-Indigenous lawyer turned academic who researches in the interdisciplinary field of law and humanities. Because of the large attendance this evening and to allow as many people as possible to pose questions, the Q&A will be curated using Slido. Please point your now silenced mobile device at the QR code behind me and the rest of it just works like magic. Uh, you'll be able to submit your questions actually during the oration and then Olivia will curate those and, and, um, and pose them to uh, Justice Williams. And again, thanks for joining us on this cold and wet evening. I'm sure it's going to be worth it. We have a large number of dignitaries in the audience tonight, so please forgive me for recognising only the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Duncan Maskell, and the President of the Trinity Council and Archbishop of Melbourne, the Most Reverend Philip Freer. Welcome this evening. The Caldwell Lecture is an important event in the Trinity College calendar. The lecture is delivered roughly every five years in the areas of art, law or literature and is the vision of the late Colin Caldwell. Colin Caldwell joined Trinity College in 1931 where he studied law, Red Law. He then went on to practice law and upon his death in 1989, he established, uh, he left a bequest that established the Colin Hicks Caldwell Trust uh, to provide for visiting lectureships in Melbourne 
that would attract renowned international scholars, as we see tonight, with expertise in art, art history, law, or literature. His bequest was the largest single gift in the college's history, and we are, of course, very thankful to Colin Fee's foresight, initiative, and generosity. I'm pleased to welcome my friend and colleague, Stuart Bett, one of the Caldwell trustees here this evening. Thanks, Stuart. It's now my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker this evening, the Honourable Sir Justice Joe Williams. Justice Williams is a New Zealander and has a Bachelor of Laws from Victoria University in Wellington and a Master of Laws with Honours from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. He became a partner with Kensington Swan in 1992 and went on to co-found Walters Williams & Co in 1994. In 1999, he became Chief Judge of the Maori Land Court and was appointed Chairperson of the Waitangi Tribunal in 2004. Justice Williams was then, there's a pattern here, Justice then, Williams was then appointed a Judge of the High Court in 2008, a Judge of the Court of Appeal in 2018, and became the first Maori Judge of the New Zealand Supreme Court in 2019. More than a jurist, Justice Williams is also a musician uh, who had a hit song with his Pacific, had a hit with his Pacific reggae song, Marenga Akai Ai, and Joel, forgive my pronunciation, my mispronunciation. Uh, and that was with the band Aotearoa. This is a 1980s resistance song riffing strongly off Bob Marley's Get Up, Stand Up, and I'd really recommend that you watch it on YouTube, as I have had done. Justice Williams has been in residence at Trinity for the last couple of weeks and has set an absolutely cracking pace with numerous conversations, meetings, presentations and radio interviews. He has not had a spare day and has contributed much to the life of our college and to the Melbourne Law School during what's been a very brief stay. Tonight his lecture will explore the ways in which the law developed in both New Zealand and Australia over the last, last century in response to indigeneity and indigenous law, and how the law can provide a firmer foothold for First Nations peoples in post-colonial states. Essentially, how can we find a robust post-colonial identity that serves us in this modern day? Australia has much to learn from our Aotearoa colleagues, and so I'd like to hand over to Justice Williams to talk in more detail about this important topic. Justice Williams. Te nei te ara kai runga te ara orangi e tu nei te ara o papa e takoto nei. Te nei te ara orangi ra ko papa e takoto nei. Kia ra rau te tapu ai o tāne ki raro. Nau mai te pō, te nei te ao, te hei, Māori ora. This is the path to my father, the sky, the path to my mother, the earth. This is the path from father sky to mother earth. Here too is the footprint of the great forest who bids farewell to the night and welcomes a new dawn, new understandings. So I speak. I hope you'll excuse me for offering formal greetings to the people whose home this truly is in my language, but I'll translate. It just sounds better in my language, <laughs> but I'll translate. In our maunga kōrero, in our way to kukiri, e te whenua e nunumi nei ki te pai tawhiti, tēnei au te hara mai nei. Te mau mai nei i aku mate huhua. Ke tangi hia me ngā mate tua tini o konei. E ngā iwi e pupuri nei te ahi kāroa o ngā mātua o ti rāia o ngā atua. Wurundari, Burong, Banarama, koutou tai. Mihi mai whakatau mai ki tēnei tamaiti a koutou. Tēnei tamaiti ko tae mai nei ki te noho ki o koutou reke reke. Speaking mountains, cleansing waters, land that disappears beyond the furthest horizon into nothing. 
I have come among you all, carrying generation upon generation of my dead upon my back, so that we can gather here to grieve for each other's ancestors once again. Great tribes who sustain the long burning fires of your ancestors, Burundri, Burong, Banarama, of your ancestors and of the gods, the fires that are the signs of authority, of your authority in this place, I ask that you make me your son welcome here. I seek only to sit at your feet and dream. Noreda tenakuto tenakuto. I've been here for 16 days. And I said to um, Ken just before this uh, event um, that I've been so busy, I think I'm going to join the union. We had dinner and a fireside chat at Trinity College with staff and students, but without the fire, um, being brutally cross-examined by Michael Pickering, uh, being skillfully cross-examined, although no less brutally, by Debbie Mortimer in an in-conversation event at the extraordinarily flash federal court. Boy, you can tell who's got the money in this country, can't you? <laughs> I've spent a morning at the Koori Court and had discussions with the magistrates, judges, and officials who make that great model for justice work, many, perhaps most of whom are indigenous. I've listened to a day of discussions at the First People's Assembly gathering at Geelong over the weekend, spoken with the co-chairs, uh, Nagara Murray and Reuben Berg, uh, at that gathering, and interestingly discovered that the elder at the Koori Court was Reuben Berg's father. It struck me that Aboriginal people are just like Māoris. Everybody's related. Um, and I spoke uh, to the few hundred participants who were there very much actively and positively engaged in the process. I spent an afternoon in discussion with members and staff of the Treaty Authority I ran a workshop at the Melbourne University Law Faculty on teaching Indigenous law. Um, I taught a class in Indigenous rights law. I met with the um, Department for Premier and Cabinet and, and staff of the Assembly in a joint discussion session to share with them the New Zealand experience of treaty making, breaking and repair. <clears throat> I had dinner with Māori staff and students at Melbourne University and had too much of Melbourne's wonderful food options and not enough of its entertainment. I blame Ken for that. And I got, and my darling Gillian got to go to Bell's Beach to watch the world surf thingy. <laughs> <laughs> got to bank those credits. And I got to spend not enough time, but more than otherwise, with my beautiful daughter Maya, who's decided to make Melbourne her home, at least for now, but we'll be haranguing her to come back shortly. So I wanted to say this, the warmth and hospitality of staff at the Indigenous Law Hub, particularly Eddie and Jenea, um, Eddie who <laughs> uh, offered to lend me his vehicle, and I said, well, that's fine, great, very generous. And he turned up at Trinity College, the gates of Trinity College, to be let in. And I discovered it was a Ford Ranger assault vehicle. <laughs> so I've had that for the last 16 days. And I do not want to give it back. <laughs> um, and Jenea, who's kind of been Auntie Jenea to me, although she's much younger, she's just been my auntie. <laughs> uh, I couldn't have... To the extent that this visit has been a success for me and my family, it's largely due to, on the academic side anyway, to Eddie and Jenea. Thank you so much. Uh, and to, I wanted to thank Kirsty Gover for pointing me in some research directions and helping me figure out what, what I should talk about tonight. Um, but especially I wanted to thank 
Trinity College. Um, what a cool place. Uh, and the, being hosted by Ken and Carol has made us feel like for 16 days we've been at home. Uh, in fact, I look back at my actual home, full as it is with adult children who refuse to move out, and I've told Ken and Carol that we're staying. Um, anyway, the, the, um, the hospitality of Ken, Carol, Amanda, and Kate, Alex has been phenomenal and truly humbling. Thank you. What I've witnessed in those 16 days of Victoria's trajectory in relation to the place, rights, and future for Indigenous people in this state has been, from the perspective of an outsider with an interest in Indigenous peoples and the law, little short of inspirational. You may be surprised to hear. So I want to spend some time talking about why that is. But start with a story. In November 1865, one of the great figures of New Zealand colonial history, Te Koti Arikirangi, Te Turuki, was arrested in what became the town of Gisborne, but was then known as Turanga, on suspicion of being part of the Fourth Rebellion. He was jailed. He asked to be tried according to law because he wrote in a letter to the governor, um, if you try me according to law, you will know that I am innocent. There were never any charges and he was never tried or convicted. He, along with 300 others, were deported to the Chatham Islands about 700 kilometers off the shore of the North Island, um, where they sat at the pleasure of the governor. After two years of waiting in what was a pretty grim climate, they hijacked a ship called the Rifleman and returned back to Gisborne. Te Korti, then just a young chief, had become by then a religious leader and a war leader. He had had a vision that was mosaic in its um, complexion, I suppose you might say, and he gathered the 300 who had traveled with him to the Chathams to cross the Red Sea and return to Israel. His words, not mine. He attacked the settlement of Gisborne, attacking both settlers and the Maori who had assisted the settlers in getting him arrested and the group uh, deported, and then headed inland by this stage in the colony of New Zealand, he was Osama bin Laden, for those of you old enough to remember. And that's no um, exaggeration at all. He was attacked repeatedly by Crown Militia as he headed inland, eventually corralled and besieged at a mountain precipice called Ngātapa, where 90 to 120 of the group he was with were executed without charge or trial, of course. He and 30 others escaped into the mountain fastness of what became the king country, the place where the Maori king retreated to when he was defeated in war uh, a few years before that in the Second Rebellion. Te Kulti stayed there, a religious leader and a, uh, and a political leader as well, until the general pardon of 1883. He had by then, despite all that had gone on, rebuilt a widespread following as both a religious and political leader. After the pardon, he wanted to head back home. A group of around 300 followers traveled with him, the two, 300 odd kilometer journey on horseback, unarmed. They were arrested at a river uh, in the Bay of Plenty as they tried to cross it for breaching the peace. The affidavit of uh, the superintendent Goodall uh, deposed that the <coughs> breach involved making the settlers anxious by his presence. He was jailed again. And then in 
and eventually released on the payment of a bond by a sympathetic chief from my country, the Hodaki, provided he promised not to instruct the lawyer. He did instruct a lawyer, funded by one of the rebellious chiefs, Rewi Maniapoto, um, which led to the famous case of Te Koti against Goodall. In the Supreme Court, an Irish judge, perhaps understandably, overturned the, um, well, declared the, the detention unlawful and um, uh, released the bond. The Crown appealed and the Court of Appeal overturned the Supreme Court decision. Now, in 1893, just a few months before Te Koti died, bearing in mind all of that experience with the law and its failings, he gathered his followers knowing that he was going to die, he said so. And he left them with this saying, which is still repeated. The canoe that you should paddle after me is that of the law, because the law should deal with the law. And I was always struck by that, because if there was anyone whose experience of the law in my country would think the law was worthless, it would be Te Koti. Yet he had this insight that the law at its best is a force for good and liberation. And he was encouraging his people to be patient. Now I've translated the end of that Mate ture a no te ture e aki into more meaningful English in modern times. What he said was eventually the law must look itself in the mirror, and when it does, you will be free. Everybody I've spoken to in Melbourne wants to hear about the place of Maori custom or tikanga in the common law of my country. I think I asked about 10 academics and a couple of judges what they, should, what they would suggest I should talk about as a judge from New Zealand with a particular interest in indigenous rights issues. And every single one of them said, talk about the Ellis decision and the incorporation of tikanga Māori, Māori custom, into the ordinary common law. So over my time here, I've been plagued by trans-Tasman comparisons, both in that respect and on the wider spectrum of relationships between the state and indigenous peoples. And I've come to the view that they're in substance different aspects of the same phenomenon. Our mutual experiences of what happens when the law finally decides to look itself in the mirror. So I want to start at the end the place of indigenous law in the common law of New Zealand, Australia and Victoria in order to situate what I really want to say right at the end. I hope I'm going to have enough time. In New Zealand, the common law was taxed about tikanga Māori or Māori custom at a relatively early stage. I've cited a few cases in the paper, the Queen and Simons, Arani and the Public Trustee, Queen and Simons, 1847, but later Arani and the Public Trustee in 1919, Public Trustee in Lowesby, 1908, Baldick and Jackson, 1910, just to quote some examples. Now, you'll probably think that's really progressive. You'd be wrong. Arani and the Public Trustee was a case about a young Pākehā girl who had been raised by a Māori adopted according to Māori custom. And the question was whether uh, customary adoption could apply to a non-Māori child. The Privy Council had got that far, so obviously uh, the adoptive mother had an estate worth fighting over. 
the Privy Council said Māori custom must evolve, of course, and if the woman, if the, the woman now was adopted according to custom, then the custom must have evolved. Sensible, you would have thought, but um, one goal for the settlers. Then the public trustee in Lowesby is a fight between a storekeeper and the public trustee over the estate of a famous chief called Tamaho Maupuku. Now, where I come from, funeral rites take days still, and they're expensive. And the poor old storekeeper um, got uh, provided goods on tick. And then after uh, the end of the funeral, the family didn't want to pay the bill. So he went to the public trustee to get the public trustee to tax the estate. He won on the basis that the extravagant cost of funereal uh, rights for chiefs was a part of native custom and should be recognised in equity. Two for the settlers. Then Baldick and Jackson, a very strange case, fight over a whale carcass valued by agreement at 200 pounds, in which two uh, whaling operations fought over who had the rights to it. The, the, the operation that had harpooned the whale and then left it floating intending to come back to it, and the operation that came afterwards found it and hauled it ashore. Chief Justice Stout rejected the idea that the claimant could not claim whales because being perfect fish they belong to the Crown by prerogative right, relying on, I think, a 1300s Act. I can't remember the name of it, but it's there if you want to look. Stout CJ rejected that idea on the basis that Māori's customarily hunted whales, and the Treaty of Waitangi guaranteed Māori customary rights. Therefore, the plaintiff could not Sue uh, could not, sorry, the defendant could not avoid responsibility because no one owned the whale. That's three for the settlers. Almost all of the early recognition, recognitions of customary law in New Zealand were either in respect of fights between settlers in which custom was both relevant and helpful to one side or the other, or a fight between Māori and settlers in which the settlers' invocation of custom was of advantage. <clears throat> so, following, coming to the modern time, the three cases are worth mentioning. One, Takamore and Clark, a fight over um, a deceased body. Uh, the question was whether the uh, deceased's non-Māori wife and executrix of the estate should be allowed to decide whether the body would be buried, where the, where the body would be buried, or whether uh, Māori custom, which would have required the body to be buried in his traditional village, should prevail. The Supreme Court found in favour of the executrix, but also said, all of that being the case, still. Māori custom or tikanga Māori is a relevant consideration for people vested with the decision-making responsibility and they had to demonstrate they'd at least taken it into account. The court saying that tikanga Māori or Māori custom is part of the values of the common law. Those ideas got picked up in Alice and uh, the Queen as it then was on the question of the continuation posthumously of a criminal appeal. Um, Peter Ellis died after Le uh, before leave to appeal to the Supreme Court was given, but before his case could be heard. A question that arose in the context of the case was, uh, is the common law in respect of continuation informed by principles of tikanga? having been raised as a question by one of the judges, actually, and not me, uh, the parties asked for an adjournment and went away to hold 
what's called a wānanga, kind of a workshop with elders about what tikanga would have required in these circumstances. And after a day, they came back with a statement of what tikanga would have required in terms of the continuation of posthumous appeals. Actually, an exceptionally clear and strong statement uh, uh, in which they said that for the reasons they indicated, the, the uh, appeal should be allowed to continue. And the court found, um, for the most part, that tikanga, uh, even though it was not decisive because the, the common law would also have allowed the appeal to conclude, found that tikanga was a part of the common law of New Zealand and was at least relevant and informative. In particular, the Chief Justice said, it adds to the vocabulary of the common law, a phrase I thought uh, was, that I thought was rather apt. So, with that short tour in mind, I can say that the New Zealand common law is a bit more experience of working with custom, but initially at least not for the reasons we would have expected. In Australia, tikanga, as I might call it, or indigenous custom, um, is an aspect of title for the most part, although there were early suggestions that Aboriginal communities were not subject to the law of the colonists, and I'm not going to explore those. I wanted to talk to you about Malerpum and Mabo and Love Toms. Um, thanks to Kirsty Gover, I decided to go back and read Malerpum, and actually it's quite a good read, um, despite the result. In that case, uh, up in the, up in the, the Gove Peninsula, uh, Blackburn, Justice Blackburn wrote that, uh, what, at least to some extent, was a thoughtful and enlightened judgment for its time. He acknowledged without hesitation that the people of the area were governed by laws and not by men, and that they maintained a system of relationships with their land and resources that was law in all material respects well adapted to its needs and circumstances. So that was actually a departure from the colonial orthodoxy, which often, in reliance on stadial theory and social Darwinism, concluded that these communities were lawless. More prob problematically, he found that the, the plaintiffs could not show that their systems, system of laws was so static that the current landowning community also owned the same land in 1788. You would have to ask yourself whether any community could do that. But that was the test. It could not show continuity. Further, Justice Blackburn said these relationship-based rights were not proprietorial. In any event, the common law of England and Australia did not recognise allodial community titles. His conclusion in that respect was a tour de force of jurisprudence sourced in all corners of the old empire. It spoke to the judge's context and time, we have to understand that, and to the, those of the cases, policies and practices that he relied on. But for present purposes, his most important conclusion was that these people were people of law and that the law continued, albeit that it didn't produce a proprietal right. This, in my experience, as I've said, was a marked departure from the old view. Now, jumping 20-odd years to Mabo, uh, which is also a product of time, that court affirmed that conclusion the indigenous people of this country were people of law and are people of law. The court expressly reframed the old plainly racist authorities to extract the necessary thread of reasoning required to bring the law on the justiciability of pre-existing legal orders maintained by indigenous Australians in line with modern Australian values of anti-discrimination and human dignity. So far, so good. Then, uh, much more recently, uh, Love Toms raised the question of whether members of Aboriginal communities uh, can be aliens 
if they're not Australian citizens. Most of you be well aware of uh, the case. Tom's was actually part Māori, a, a, a relatively common mix uh, in this country, as I've discovered, having met with many Aboriginal people over the last 16 days, a big chunk of whom have said, I also belong to such and such a tribe in Aotearoa, which is great. Um, the court applied the so-called tripartite test. There has to be dissent, there has to be acceptance by the community and by those in authority within the community. Belonging, the court said, is a matter of fact and of indigenous law. That's important. Belonging is a matter of fact and of indigenous law. The justification for this approach was powerfully, strikingly, in fact, relationship with country. Not title, but relationship. And in fact, not even the individual's relationship with country, but that of their community. <coughs> Combined with the community's bestowal of recognition of the individual according to that community's laws about the dispensing of authority, I suppose. So belonging through pre-existing connection to country demonstrated by persistence of community espousing such connection cannot be removed by the Commonwealth or, I assume, anybody else anymore. So the Australian context seems to suggest that Aboriginal law has been seen mostly as, as most meaningful in native title contexts and determinations, looked upon as of evidential utility rather than a phenomenon in its own right, independent of the concept of title. That's understandable, I suppose. Native title is, of course, the true disruptive idea in a continent historically characterised by terra nullius attitudes. But Love Toms changes that in a potentially significant way, I think, especially if seen in the context of wider developments that I'm going to come to. If that's the common law, let me shift quickly to statutory recognition of custom. In New Zealand, recognition from 1991 to the present has been across a wide range of statutory categories, from environmental law, local government law, um, management of the exclusive economic zone and territorial sea, hazardous substances, uh, what we call oranga tamariki, um, and what would be called Children, Youth and Their Families Act, um, the Sentencing Act, particularly Section 27, Intellectual Property, the Trademarks Act, the Patents Act, the Conservation Act, and under which the uh, Conservation Department administers about a third of the country, which has a treaty clause in it, the Education and Tertiary Education Act, the Public Service Act, uh, governing the employment and management of uh, civil servants, which refers specifically to the importance of the Crown Māori relationship and of the Treaty of Waitangi as the framing of that relationship. That's just a selection of the prob 20 or 30 uh, acts that make reference either to custom, cultural values, or the Treaty of Waitangi. Statutory recognition of Aboriginal law in, in Australia and Victoria follows a similar kind of track, but without, perhaps without the, um, without the scale. Interestingly, across the same time frame, from about 1993 to the present, you'll all be familiar with the Native Title Act, and if I park that there as the only Commonwealth Act I'm going to refer to, you've got Section 1A of the Constitution Act, uh, Children, Youth and Their Families Act 2005, which includes child placement principles referring specifically to Aboriginal self-determination, priority of placement with Aboriginal families and communities, and to the central role of Aboriginal agencies and approved organisations. Uh, also provides, rather strikingly from a New Zealand perspective, uh, the ability of the relevant child welfare organisation to transfer all power in respect of uplifted, if I can say that, use that term, children, 
to an Aboriginal, to an approved Aboriginal organisation. There's no such provision even approaching that in my country. And I'm told that there are several hundred children who are administered by Aboriginal, cared for by Aboriginal organisations pursuant to those provisions. Uh, in New Zealand, the system is nowhere near that level of transfer of power. You have the Aboriginal Heritage Act 2006, part three of which says Aboriginal heritage cannot be harmed. The harming of Aboriginal heritage is likely to be an offence. Aboriginal heritage is defined by reference to culture and law and is, I think, um, of broad import. Then there's reference to public land management agreements on, on publicly owned land and the RAPS and the creation of the Aboriginal Heritage Council. There's the Traditional Owner Settlement Act 2010, and I'll come to the treaty stuff a little later. Now, so, at various, in various places in both of our homes, there is recognition either implicitly or explicitly of indigenous law in statutes. Equally, and perhaps even more pervasively, in both of our homes, there is recognition of indigenous law in executive or judicial policy and practice. I spent a morning with one such uh, phenomenon, the Koori Courts, um, which apply, I was told by, um, by staff and judges there, both to the, magistrates, uh, to the magistrates' court, the county court, the children's court, the coroner's court, and the Supreme Court, either as a full-blown procedural um, innovation or by way of providing support infrastructure outside the court in respect particularly of the Supreme Court. Similar sort of phenomena back home, the Rangatahi Court and Matariki Courts uh, perform the same sorts of function, but more recently there's been a drive to um, mainstream these principles into all um, uh, criminal law and all sentencing. So that's a striking difference, although the innovation hasn't yet um, landed, so we'll see how that goes. You see the rise and expansion of Aboriginal self-determination organisations um, here, both in country and unrelated to country, right across the board, basically in all exercises of what would otherwise be state power. And of course, it's worth mentioning the innovations in legal education. The Council of Law Deans uh, standards, which refer to the requirement that students have a knowledge and understanding of indigenous perspectives of the law. And in my country, the Council for Legal Education directing that all law schools must teach Maori custom as a core subject starting from 2025. Okay, so to wrap this up, referring to uh, both Victoria and New Zealand, we share a body of common law acceptance of a pre-existing law still unextinguished in the common law, an expanding body of legislative reference and reliance on indigenous law, and a full palette of policy-based mechanisms and practice-based mechanisms providing for expressing or reflecting Aboriginal law. So, onto that platform, can we talk about treaty in Victoria? Because in 2018, there was enacted advancing the treaty process with Aboriginal Victorians Act. Provided for the creation of a framework agreement the establishment of an assembly of First Peoples and a self-determination fund and an umpire of the process called the Treaty Authority. In a sense, from looking at it from the perspective of someone from Aotearoa, it is as if the Treaty of Waitangi and the treaty settlement process that has been gone through in my country for the last 30 years has been collapsed 
into one set of interconnected transformative processes. Because the, the, the Act provides for a statewide treaty, perhaps like the Treaty of Waitangi, a framework treaty, and then individual treaties pursuant to, next to, beside, above, hard to tell, with respect to native owner communities. It's as if history has been uh, optimistically collapsed into a single event, both the making of the treaty and the providing of reparations for the breach of the principles reflected in the treaty. In New I mention this because comparing it to the experience in New Zealand, I think, provides quite important insights that hadn't occurred to me until I'd spent the last 16 days here and met with so many people. You see, in my country, there was a Treaty of Waitangi entered into in 1840, guaranteeing both resource rights, the protection of resource rights, and self-government. Over the next 150 to 180 years, that treaty was routinely breached, and by the 1990s, the government accepted that it was time to take a look at what had happened and make such reparations as were possible. The first signs of the law being prepared to take a look in the mirror. What follows was the flow of 30 years of treaty settlements, including a nat national fisheries settlement, various tribal settlements, 50 or 60 of them all up, locking in crown tribal relationships, economic bases, governance structures, and impacting on law and policy, both at central and local government level leading more recently, for example, to the recognition of the legal personality of a river and of a forest. So in a sense, the system back home over the last 30 years grew organically, and it really was organically, into something that looks like wraps, traditional owner agreements, and Aboriginal organization arrangements with the state all wrapped up in one settlement by settlement, unframed, growing organically. So here's the rub. In New Zealand, the slew of statutory recognitions of tikanga in the environment, culture, criminal justice, child welfare, IP, education, and so on, just grew as the settlement process developed and it reached its highest productivity as we were approaching the last third of the land claim settlements. By that stage, politicians on both sides, Māori and central government, their officials, communities, and so forth, both Māori and non-Māori communities, got used to the idea that there was a plurality in the country now and discovered for the most part, that it wasn't that scary. The process was often very granular. And then came, really from the mid-1990s 90s on, a Cambrian explosion, it was described in one piece of writing, of legislative recognition of tikanga. These things weren't initially even framed as law. They were flame, framed as cultural, acceptance of cultural matters, cultural values in respect of the caring for children or the management of the environment and so forth. But that changed. Common law recognition of tikanga as its own phenomenon in my country, independent of title and about people as much as about landscape, occurred in that context of vigorous, energetic change through treaty settlements. A context of rapid relationship building activity within indigenous communities 
and between those communities and the state. That slew of legislative recognitions didn't just pop out of the blue. It was a symptom of the deeper change going on, primarily through the treaty settlement process. Although it's often hard to see the connection, it's plain that it is there. The reason I mention this is that that context has clearly begun to develop here. Yes, there are real differences in context, demographics, scale, history, indigenous plurality, um, and federalism, but the creation of the assembly, the incentives on indigenous communities to achieve recognition standards, to negotiate treaties, all managed by a treaty authority made up of inside outsiders, indigenous people themselves, and supported by an indigenous managed fund, will be a greater game changer in my view here than the settle treaty settlement process was in New Zealand. We have a Treaty of Waitangi, the breach of its terms, and the reparative treaty settlements process that started 150 years later and is still going 180 years later. Here, the treaty and the reparations process are collapsed into a single complex set of engagements. That's more challenging. After 30 years of experience of a similar process in New Zealand, I'm under no illusion as to the difficulty of successful treaty making. Without the state and indigenous peoples working to build some kind of shared vision for treaty, chances are the process will fail. But if it goes moderately well, its impact will be much bigger than the treaties themselves and what they represent to the parties here in Victoria. You see, we've learned over 30 years that the process will also trigger legislative and judicial acceptance of Aboriginal law across multiple legal categories, some unrelated to treaty at all. This happens as people become increasingly familiar with the vocabulary of treaty transformation and what it represents. In other words, you're going to get your own Cambrian explosion of recognition. That made me think, you know, Dennis Denuto was kind of right. It's a little bit Mabo, and the Constitution, although Section 1A of the Victorian one, not the other one, but mostly, you know, it's the vibe. <laughs> the vibe will change with the energy around the settlement process if it takes off. And when, in post-colonial societies, the law finally agrees to look itself in the mirror, that very act is transformative. Tēnā koutou. So one of the things I was thinking about when you were talking um, about this idea of it being change being perhaps a little less scary as courts and lawyers and the general public get used to um, the idea. So you're talking about what had happened over 30 years through the, the settlement process in New Zealand, in Aotearoa, and that we're maybe at a different point of that process. And I was just thinking about the, the idea that in a way pluralism isn't necessarily new to common law. Um, we have federalism, we have states and federal governments and local governments and those different types of laws interact. We have common law and equity that until the 1970s in New South Wales were entirely different jurisdictions. Um, they only fused quite late there, uh, earlier in other places. If you wind back into English common law history further, there are different types of laws. There's the law of the hundred, a regional one. There's professional laws like the law of the merchant, the law of the tannery, there's the law of the forest. These are all 100% different jurisdictions and laws in the kind of the way if you think of a, an, a, a European map. And then common law interacted with them. And so I'm just wondering whether um, the experience in, in particular experience as a judge is of thinking through 
the way that the, the meeting of multiple laws of Tatanga, Tatanga Māori in, and common law in, in New Zealand and the process we're going through here of meeting between common law and multiple laws, whether actually there is capacity for the common law to be a little less scared and, and work through having better relations. Um, there are, well, all of that's correct, of course, um, beautifully summarised. Of course, the common law was partly designed to squash pluralism. That's why it was called the common law. Um, it was trying to stop all this mad, you know, custom-based valley-by-valley law that was the norm in England um, prior, I think, for the other legal historians in the room prior to the, you know, the rise of the, the, um, the true monarchy. Uh, but the common law is still quite pluralist in its bent. It's much more willing to accommodate shifts than other forms of, than I think the civil law um, for a start, partly because it's a little more organic, less and less so in modern times, but it's judge made. We often forget about that in this legislatively dominated world, but the common law is and was made by the judges. And the law of tort and the law of contract is by and large not statutory. The, um, the standard that you have to prove someone guilty according uh, uh, um, uh, beyond reasonable doubt is not to be found in any statute. It's a judge made rule. So we do have to kind of remember that, um, that there is this residual puddle in which the judges are the lawmakers. What's crucial about um, what happened in New Zealand was that the lead was for a 30 year period taken by the legislature, driven off the energy created by the treaty settlement process that made the system much more comfortable with that plurality. And then once you have a whole matrix of laws recognizing tikanga Māori in one way or another, the judges, as they usually do, just figured they should catch up. Or they'll be administering a law that is anachronistic. And in Alice, we said that the, the, the rules for the recognition of custom, um, time and memorial, not unreasonable, all of that sort of, the old, basically the old um, uh, religious rules um, should be dumped because they were racist. And, um, and replaced by a set of uh, um, acceptance and adoption principles more consistent with the circumstances of a country like New Zealand after colonization, post-colonially, if you like. Hmm. Now, there are some risks, though. One of the dangers is, like the common law, the judges run off with custom and kill it. And so we do have to teach the judges uh, back home, that they are not the source of custom. The source of custom is somewhere else. They do not uh, declare it. They do not amend it. They do not develop it. They simply take it, apply it, and give it back. And that is a bit of a mind shift. Um, but the judges are embracing it by and large and once you get to the point where the law schools are teaching it that way and we're running a postgraduate course for judges now in Tikanga, it's going to become pretty much standard I think within a decade. I, I apologise for looking like a rude teenager scrolling through the phone while I'm yeah. listening to you. <laughs> this is me trying to get my head around the questions. Um, I guess I've got two questions and I might just put them to you. They're, they're sort of summaries of what I'm being asked. Um, one is about legal education because you just mentioned it. Um, but the other one I wanted to ask first was um, just, and I know it's always hard to, uh, to respond to the generalist question, but um, has, I think, actually, I'll read the question because it was worded. Um, uh, what areas of concern do today's um, Maoris have about the changes that are occurring with New Zealand law? So um, just not necessarily speak on behalf of everyone, but just that kind of, what are some of the potential 
um, minefields that are going on of that that shift and that re-relation that re-relationship of power. And then yes. that's the last question about institutions. Yes, good question. It's a it's not without controversy, obviously, because there is a fear that if you hand this sort of responsibility over to a bunch of judges um, who've been the problem, how can that be helping? They will be saying, uh, they do say, and I completely understand that, but so much has changed in terms of judges having to deal with tikanga on a daily basis in their work that not having some sort of expertise and some sort of ability to apply it is no longer realistic, albeit that it is fraught with risk. Uh, and there are those who say we should just keep it separate and keep it out of the courts. I am not unsympathetic to that view because I realise the risks. I simply think that horse bolted some time ago now and we have to work with it. I. I guess um, if I can ask perhaps two more questions, if that's all right, just um, to one question about legal education that I foreshadowed, um, and another one about the relationship between courts and government, um, but I'll, I'll do, talk to the legal education one. There's a series of questions, and sorry to summarise everyone's questions, um, about, um, I guess, what, what can be done in law schools in Australia, Melbourne Law School in particular, um, in terms of ensuring that mob are safe, uh, when they're taught, but also ensuring the process of um, we don't yet have the, the change that is required of New Zealand law schools by 2025 to teach in certain ways. So I guess the question is what can staff and students and the legal profession more generally do to assist the educational and the pedagogical shift that, that is coming? Yes. Well, look, what, what we've discovered over the last five years is that um, that the law is increasingly requiring lawyers to make a cognitive shift, to see law as not just one set of givens, but that set of givens and then another set of givens in particular circumstances in order to make a sense of, in order to make proper sense of the social, political, cultural reality of the place. Um, and that, you know, that's, that's not easy. The law schools um, will struggle to kind of feed students that shift given the lack of expertise in the law schools themselves. And my advice back home and here is that the law schools, when this comes, and having witnessed the equivalent process over the last 30 years back home, I suggest to you it is going to come. Um, the law schools will need to reach out to the traditional lawyers in the communities. They won't have LLB or JD after their names, but they'll be lawyers nonetheless. Build partnerships with those groupings um, and teach in, a, teach in a plural way. These things are best taught by teams, I think. Uh, uh, a, a JD style lawyer and a traditional lawyer working together to frame what they're teaching as law in different ways. The great, uh, I have to say, I wish I had learnt about tikanga at law school when I was a student. I would have been a much better lawyer if I, if I had. And one of the reasons for that is that learning an entirely different form of law teaches you about the contingency of some of the deep givens in our legal education. As you reframe the idea of um, relationships and transactions, for example. I mean, you say to the, I often say to the, um, law students if I'm giving a lecture, you don't have any problem understanding contract, you've probably entered into four of them on the way to this class. But you will have a real problem understanding how kinship determines relationships and obligations in a non-market in a non -market economy. And you're going to have to learn not just the rules themselves, but the context, because you, it's not part of your context. That's the cognitive shift that needs to occur if, the, um, if this change is to, be, is to produce a successful result. Mm.
Yeah, thank you. Um, can I just ask one last question, if that's all right? Um, it's a, slight, a double question, because you know I was going to sneak it in. Um, it's thinking about um, the relationship between courts and parliament um, and, and how that works in this, in this sort of op this change that we're thinking about. Um, one question was asking, um, you talked enthusiastically about where we are at with the Victorian treaty process, but kind of asked the question about do you have any advice for other states that are at different points with that treaty process. Also, the federal government has sort of stepped back. Some of the states have stepped back. Some of the states are at various points in that treaty process. So just if there's anything, um, advice that you might, or, or, or thoughts you had in terms of where other states are not quite at the same point as Victoria are at, because Victoria is quite far ahead on, on, in terms of the treaty. Um, and the other question, I'm just going to read it, which is similar, is, um, is are you optimistic that the vibe will prevail in Aotearoa and potentially Victoria if hostile governments try to undo recognition of Tikunga um, or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander law in law and policy? So that kind of court parliament relationship. Yes, I, I often get asked that question. Um, this, what's happened in my country over 30 years has happened irrespective of the um, political fashion. Of course, it's um, it's bumpy and it, it, it rises and falls. It's not a straight trajectory at all, um, but it is looking at it over time a clear trajectory, uh, and that is because as things change, change makes change. Mm -hmm. By that I mean that as things change and aren't as scary as they appear to be, certain um, attitudes will shift. Empathy is possible when the person or community you're having to empathise with is something you're more familiar with. And so in my country, the more present the Māori language is in the life of the country, the less other Māori is. That's not to say it's a, it's a straight path, it is not. And there will be bumps uh, in the road and have been regularly over the last 30 years. But it doesn't seem to have changed the trajectory. It might slow it down, it might speed it up, it might slightly divert it, but it doesn't change the trajectory. Great. Well, I might leave it there. Thank you for those who submitted Slido comments and I didn't get to them. I will pass them on to the judge. Um, but I just want to thank you for the opportunity to, to listen and have some conversation. Pleasure. Thank you, Olivia. Again, again, I'd like to uh, thank you all for attending this evening. I'd like to thank the Melbourne Law School and particularly our tech crew for, um, for setting up so quickly this afternoon and, and making this run almost smooth, smoothly, almost faultlessly. So thank you very much. Olivia, thank you for the questions and for mastering Slido so quickly. And uh, a sincere thank you to Justice Joe Williams for the time he spent with us in the last 16 days. As you can sense, he's an incredibly gracious uh, guest and uh, a welcome visitor uh, to our college and I'm sure to the Melbourne Law School. And Gillian, I'm glad that you got to see some surfing um, and not on a day when it was cancelled with a lack of waves, which is kind of ironic. But uh, thank you all for attending this evening. Thank you, Justice Joe. One last round of applause for Justice Joe Williams. Thank you.